Good evening, everyone. How are you? Welcome. My name is Dave Keller. I'll be uh, speaking with you tonight. My role is I'm the chief market strategist at StockCharts.com. I um, just joined there about two months ago, uh, based out of uh, Redmond, Washington. So this is my first uh, time actually to Las Vegas and not being jet lagged, which is actually a nice change of pace with most of my career in the Northeast. So I'm used to being very tired and groggy right about now. So I'm feeling great. Uh, so that's good. So we'll have plenty of energy hopefully tonight. Um, I appreciate you all attending. What, what I wanted to do with our time is talk about the five modes of mindful traders. Um, I was asked uh, earlier, you know, do you practice mindfulness? Do you practice meditation? And I'll, I'll share with you sort of the personal story that got me to thinking about mindful trading, mindful investing, but the, the quick answer is yes. And in a particularly stressful time of my life, uh, meditation and mindfulness practice really helped me uh, deal with things in, in such a positive way. And I found it's a, it's a way that has helped shape uh, who I am for sure. And as a subtitle, um, it's about improving returns, but it's mainly about minimizing mental mistakes. And what we're going to talk about are some of the ways that we're hardwired as humans, as individuals. And we are hardwired, unfortunately, to make poor decisions with our money, with our investments. And that's okay, um, because, uh, because the good news is there are ways to manage that. There are ways to sort of, uh, you know, to deal with that. And your emotions are not a bad thing. Your emotions actually have some positive benefits. And you're not broken because you're human. You're just human. And so what we're going to talk about are, are what I would call the five modes. These are the five steps that I think we each need to take as traders, as investors, to try to get that mental baggage out of the way. Does that sound okay? Okay. This is a disclaimer, so don't listen to anything I say, buy or sell anything based on what I say. I'm sure you've seen these. Um, so quick story, I'll, I'll, I'll try to share some anecdotal thoughts anytime, anytime I can. Um, I've been in the industry for about 19 years, um, and I, the reason why I'm showing in graphical form my career history, uh, I was at Fidelity Investments, which I'll talk about in a, in a little minute, from 2008 to 2016. And one of the things I did was run the chart room, which, uh, have any of you been to the chart room in Boston? No. It is a physical space in the Fidelity home office and also all the global offices now dedicated to market history and technical analysis. So I ran the technical research team and, uh, and part of what we did was, you know, manage this chart room, manage this visual repository of market history. And the chairman of Fidelity, uh, Ned Johnson, is a huge fan of technical analysis charting and, and that's why we had it. Um, and funny story, I was actually hiring a graphic designer to help design some new uh, multi-touch displays with really cool charting interactive experiences. And so we got probably 300 resumes for this one position. And the one that immediately went to the top was the person just had a resume page and at the top had a chart of the S&P 500 <laughs> and little bullet points with their career history on the S&P. And I was like, this is someone who knows what we're trying to do. Talk about knowing your audience. He was one of the three we called in and he was the one we ended up hiring. Um, so uh, Ken Snow was the inspiration for this, but here's my career history in, in chart form. So I started in the industry in uh, June of 2000 at Bloomberg in, uh, in New York City. Uh, grew up in the Midwest, grew up in the Cleveland area, went to Ohio State, and then uh, quickly got out of there when I could and went to uh, the East Coast, went to New York, and uh, was at Bloomberg. There I ran a, a number of different things, but eventually found technical analysis and, um, and, uh, and was very excited about the fact that you could actually look at charts for a living once I learned that that was something I could do. Um, I studied music and psychology as an undergrad, so as you know, very traditional uh, way to get into the financial industry. Um, and it's funny, if you, I'm assuming you guys have looked at a chart before because you're, you're, you're here and most people have. If you think about it, somehow those two degrees that it took me six years to earn as an undergrad somehow set me up for a good career in finance. I try to remind my father of that often. Uh, but music is very mathematical. It's all about finding patterns. It's all about relationships, which has served me very well as a technical analyst. Uh, and also psychology, I feel like I've used that every day, trying to get inside the head of all the other investors and get out of the, my, own, my own thinking, get out of the way there. So I was there at Bloomberg from 2000 to 2008, uh, traveled around North and South America, um, basically uh, working for institutional investors, helping them use technical analysis incorporated into their, into their trading. Um, I then moved up to Boston in 2008, that's the second logo, and I, I was running the technical research team for about eight and a half years. And so we were part of the asset management division. We ran about 2.1 trillion in assets, I want to say, about 900 billion in equities. And so I was one of the directors of research. I ran the technical research department and then um, the new associate program uh, for people right out of undergrad. 
And so my job with my analysts was basically to help all the equity portfolio managers make buy and sell decisions based on technical analysis. And then they would combine it with the fundamental research, the quantitative research, and have a good holistic view of what was happening. So at this point, I was pretty confident that I personally was causing cyclical bear markets because every time I made a career change, if you notice, as a pattern recognizer, you see what happened. The good news is that broke, so that we, we've fixed that hopefully. Um, but then I got involved with the, uh, the CMT Association, which was called the MTA at the time, and I ended up joining the board, and I was the president of the MTA from 2010 to 2014, uh, which was a lot of fun. We grew the organization globally at that time. Um, then the little plane logo you see on the right was when I left Fidelity, um, moved back to Cleveland where I had some family, launched my own research firm, research and consulting firm called Sierra Alpha Research. I'll, I'll share why I, I named it that way. Started working with stock charts and then about two months ago relocated to the Northwest to Redmond, Washington and joined stock charts at Chief Market Strategist. So that is my visual and very quick description of my background. So hopefully um, I've earned the right to speak to you today. I hope, that, I hope I've done that. Um, so what I want to talk to you about are what I call the five modes of mindful investors. And I'm going to share with you just the general flow of this thinking. And then we're going to go through each one of them, talk about what it is uh, and how I've learned to incorporate them into my own trading and investing. And hopefully my goal with this presentation is by the end, you've learned just a couple things that you can go back home, think about how you can maybe upgrade your own processes. OK, so step one in your in your road to recovery is to admit you have a problem. And there's a reason why. 12-step programs, the first step is to admit you have a problem because unless you can do that, all the other 11 steps are pretty meaningless. And so step one is recognizing that you as a human are imperfect and you're not going to make good decisions sometimes. That is the fact. And I have worked with individual traders trading their own account of $2,000. I've worked with portfolio managers running $80 billion in a fund. They make the same exact mistakes that, that anyone does. They are, they are universal. And I would tell you, I would love to tell you that if you study behavioral finance a lot, which I have, that you are magically immune from those. And the problem is, no, you just know that you're doing it. And you, you have to hit yourself in the head and go, well, hold on, I know this. But it, it, it's impossible. I mean, you are so hardwired for it. So step one is recognition. Step two is restrain. Restrain the temptation to fall victim to some of these negative thoughts and, and thoughts that are going to, to draw you to the wrong positioning, to the wrong decision. And we'll talk about some of the, some of the tools that I think you can use on each one of these. The third one is respect, and it's not respect yourself, although that's important. For me, it's respecting the market, respecting that the market's out of your control. There's this thing called illusion of control, where you, 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 you take a position and you literally, with your whole self, your whole body, are trying to will the chart to do a certain thing. I'm sure with all the head shaking, you have done this. Um, that clearly does not work a lot of times, as you probably have found. So we'll talk about how to sort of get out of that negative thinking. The fourth one is review, and it's reviewing what's going on around you. Um, I've, uh, I've spent a lot of hours as a student pilot. I have not completed it yet. And at some point, um, my wife tells me, my son just turned three, and, and she said, uh, I will tell you when you were cleared to go up in the air again. She has not given me the green light, so I'm still grounded uh, in daddy mode, but that's OK. It's worth it. Uh, but we'll talk about, as a pilot, how you review your surroundings and why it's so important to you, and why it's an important as, a, as an, a trader as well. Finally, it's reflect. Having a, a normal, regular, systematic way that you go back and reflect on your successes and, more importantly, reflect on your failures. We've been interviewing a number of the other speakers uh, for Stock Charts TV out here. You might have seen us uh, pulling some of the speakers off and doing, um, doing some interviews. And I asked every one of them, what was your worst call? What was the moment when things completely went wrong? You took a position, you got killed. What did you learn from it? And every one of them had a number of examples, <laughs> but they had one very good one that they could talk through. And the more you trade, the more you will have examples like that. But having a process that you go back and reflect is really important. So what we're going to do now is go through each one of these individually. I'm going to share with you some examples, what they are in more detail, and then how you can prevent uh, or, or maybe upgrade your process through each one of those. So the first one is recognition. And as I mentioned, there's a reason why the first step in any recovery experience is to admit, is to recognize that there's an issue. And I think a lot of times there's a bravado that comes with trading. Anytime someone tells you there's a sure thing, there isn't. And I've, I've, I've looked at all of them. They are not out there. And they tell you they found something that is 100% accurate. There is nothing like that. Um, and so a lot of times we convince ourselves. There's a lot of behavioral Things we talk about, overconfidence, and it's funny, I've coached 
and, 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 uh, and managed professional investors, professional uh, analysts, and we, we tell them to pound the table. When something's going, you know, when, when you take a position, pound the table and, and have conviction and be sure of what you're doing. But the problem is we're in an industry and, and you're doing something where uh, you're wrong a lot. Can anyone guess, and we, we studied when I was at Fidelity, how, uh, accuracy rates, how accurate professional analysts were, professional equity analysts, and, and essentially just, if you think something's gonna outperform, does it actually outperform, or, or the opposite? What percent of the time would you guess a professional analyst, on average, is correct on that directional call? 35, four, that would be so sad. It's not that bad. 65, okay. 45? 80 to 90, boy, that, they, they wish it was that high, but it is not. It's 53%, 53%. So what happens is you get these guys that went to Dartmouth or Harvard or, or any school anywhere, UNLV, for example, and um, are used to getting really good grades and used to doing very well, and you're going in an industry where you're going to be wrong just about half the time. And that's tough. That is a tough switch for a lot of people to do professionally and individually as well. You're going to be wrong a lot, even if you have a perfect system, right? A perfect platform, a perfect charting system, a good approach. It's going to be wrong sometimes. And so recognizing when you're wrong is what's so important. So there has to be a self-awareness. There has to be a process where you look in the mirror and actually think about your own decision making. Um, we very quickly like to ignore our, our past when it's, when it's bad um, and think about our past when it's good and you need to sort of do the opposite. So I want to share with you a paradigm that I kind of describe the mindless investor versus the mindful investor. And as I talk through this, you may find some examples in your own thinking that you probably fall victim to. In my opinion, the mindless investor, this idea, this hypothetical mindless investor ignores the past. If something went wrong, just get away from it, right? Push it away mentally, go on to the next thing. And there are reasons why we do that because it's, it's painful to relive painful times. Um, so it's great to kind of move forward. But the problem is you're, you're missing out on an opportunity to get better, right? To improve and reflect on some of your poor decisions. We worry about the present. The present and what's happening is a source of anxiety. What's the Fed going to do? What is Trump going to do? What is China going to do? What, how are all these things going to infect, uh, infect affect my portfolio, right? And so that's a source of anxiety. The third is we are afraid of the future. We're, it's uncertain. It always will be. We will never know what's going to come tomorrow. And that uncertainty causes fear, right? And, and all of those things, none of those things are calm and relaxing ways to interact with your environment. So the way I would think of it is a mindful investor, number one, is in the middle of all these things. They are having a healthy interaction with past, present, and future, okay? So instead of ignoring the past, you learn from the past. You have a process of reflecting on when you've done well and reflecting on when you've done poorly. And we'll show some examples uh, later about where that can be pretty helpful. We plan for the future, so we don't have to worry about it. It's not a source of anxiety because we have a good game plan. Um, uh, Arthur Hill, who's one of my, my fellow contributors at Stock Charts, at the end of every one of his posts says, plan your trade and trade your plan. And a number of people have said things like that. That's so key, and we forget to have a good game plan in place before we take action, right? That's when it's most important. And then we live for the present. This is where it gets to mindfulness and having an awareness of what's going on around you. Mindfulness meditation and mindful awareness, I would argue, is about the now. It's about having an awareness of where you're at and what's going on around you. We get so caught up in uh, the flickering ticks of the market, all the other things affecting us personally, we don't have a good awareness of the present. So in my opinion, a mindful investor has a healthy interaction with past, present, and future. So how do you move from this state of mindlessness to mindfulness? And this is part of this recognition that we're having trouble uh, you know, with, these, with these relationships. And I, I will try to simplify this as much as possible. My first recommendation to you is keep a journal. And I don't mean a trading journal. That's important too. We're going to talk about that later. I mean keep a journal of what's actually going on inside your head. Um, there's a book that I read years ago uh, talking, uh, what, what is the name of that book? It's all about unleashing creativity in your, in your process. Um, it'll come to me later uh, at an inappropriate time. But basically when I read this book, it, 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 it talked about writing three pages. Every morning, write out three pages. Doesn't matter what it is, just start getting whatever is in your head out of your head onto a piece of paper. And what's funny is if you tried, any of you keep a journal every day? A Couple of you, good. When you do it, you'll find page one is kind of annoying. Page two, you're wondering why you did it. And all of a sudden on page three, something really magical starts to happen because all these really creative ideas that were just getting clogged up with all this other stuff kind of comes out. And so at the bottom of my uh, notebook, I've been doing this for years now, 
This is what I write at the end of, this is literally me, very technology forward, taking a picture of my notepad with my phone uh, a little bit ago. But, but basically, this is what I put at the end. And I'll, I'll share with you the very first thing, RR number six. Has anyone heard of the story of remember rule number six? OK. Uh, for those of you that did not, did not say yes, here's the story. Um, it's been a number of different versions, but basically a prime minister is in his office. Another head of state is with him. They're kind of talking about what's going on, uh, talking about policy and everything. All of a sudden, one of his deputies comes in and says, huge problem. Not, I don't know what to do. I'm losing my mind. Or something. He goes, whoa, 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 Bob, remember rule number six. He goes, you're right. Stops, leaves the room. No problem. So then they keep talking. A few moments later, one of the other deputies comes in the room. So it's a disaster. I don't know what to do. So it's a huge problem. What are we going to do? She goes, Rebecca, hold on. Remember rule number six. She goes, yeah, you're right. Walks out. This happens a couple more times. And this, this other head of state is thinking, what? This is unbelievable. Like, look at how quickly it just disarms their thinking. Says, listen, what is rule number six? This is fat. This is amazing. How does this work so well? Says, rule number six is don't take yourself so goddamn seriously. He goes, that's great. What are the other five rules? He says, there aren't any. <laughs> So the reason why I put this at the end, and I have it on my monitor very clearly, so if I get stressed out, I look right down there, it is to not take yourself too seriously. One of my mentors, Ralph Akampora, I don't know if any of you knew him, he, he mentored many of us in the, uh, in the industry, especially technical analysts, and he immediately, his approach to life and to market analysis and how to interact with people was completely disarming. And it's all about not taking it too seriously, going with the flow. And so I'd encourage you to experiment with things like this, ways that you can get your negative thoughts out of your head, because that clears the way for clearer thinking. All right? So step one is recognize. We are not wired perfectly for investments, and that's okay, because we have tools that we can use to address them. So step two, now that we admit that we're a little bit flawed, how do we restrain ourselves? How do we, how do we prevent ourselves from making some of these uh, decisions. Well, I will tell you, you know, remember, humans are emotional beings, right? There's a reason why there's this fight or flight mechanism, right? We naturally have emotional reactions to things, and that's okay. Um, people often talk about, how the, talk about how the markets are driven by fear and greed, and I have argued for years it's not fear and greed, it's fear and fear. It's fear of losing everything on the way down, and it's fear of missing out on the way up FOMO that a lot of people have talked about. So fear is a huge motivator, right? That is what causes you to sell too early to buy too late, all these things that we do that you know you shouldn't be doing and you do it anyways, it's the emotions that are kind of driving it. So that's kind of how, we, how we're wired. So how do we get some of the emotional baggage out of the way and make sure we have more of a systematic, disciplined process? Um, how many of you have tried to fly an airplane before? Anyone? A number of you. Fantastic. We could, the next, uh, we're, we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about flying that. That's great. Um, Good to have kindred spirits in the room. So as I mentioned, I have about 80 hours in a Cessna 172R. I have not completed it yet. I'm excited to do it when my wife gives me the green light. Um, so those of you that said, yes, I have tried to fly a plane, I'm going to talk you through what happens, right? You, um, you figure out where you're going to go. You go out into the, into the plane. You get in. You fire it up. You take off. What did I completely miss in that process that I just described? <laughs> yeah. Your flight plan. Your checklist. Your pre-flight checklist. Right? What are you going to do? My wife was so nervous when I started flying little airplanes. And I told her, listen, if you checked your car as thoroughly as I checked this airplane, you wouldn't be that worried. <laughs> you literally are going through hundreds of things and checking and literally moving every little flap, every little aileron of the rudder. You are firing up things, uh, systems up and down to check the redundancy and make sure that the batteries are fine, the systems are operating fine. So by the time you get, get up in the air, you are so confident the plane's going to operate pretty well. The problem with that is the only thing that leaves for accidents is yourself, right? Most airplane accidents, and, and one of the more dark and macabre things you do as a student pilot is you study accidents and you learn where things went wrong. And 90 plus percent of them are caused by human error. It's the pilot falling asleep, running out, the most common accident, running out of gas before you get back to the airport, just short of the runway. Classic, right? And that's so avoidable if you just plan ahead a little bit. So. This is uh, directly from the Cessna 172R pre-flight checklist. At the top, this is what you do right before you light up the propeller and, and get going. So you turn the master switch on, you turn the beacon on, which is an emergency signal. You throttle open just a little bit. Uh, mixture idle cutoff, that's just the, the setting, the, the fuel air mixture. You don't need a fuel pump, so you turn that off. Then you yell out the window, you fire up the propeller. And again, you've, you've checked so many steps. I have done that many, many times, and the propeller has 100% of the time come on just fine because I'm pretty sure it's going to work. Now, that's not that stressful, and, and being on the ground is, is pretty not stressful. 
Uh, and uh, a mentor of mine, Greg Morris, who's a, a Top Gun instructor, airline pilot, always said it's better to be on the ground wishing you were in the air than in the air wishing you were on the ground. So on the ground, it's not that bad. Um, this is actually a little more stressful, uh, an engine cutout. So one of the favorite tricks of a uh, flight instructor, once you start learning, is they'll just randomly pull the throttle out and say, okay, you just lost your engine, what do you do? And I'll tell you what you do the first time that happens, you completely panic and your heart's pumping and it's in your throat and the plane just shudders and starts going down. And while that is happening and you have all these physical sensations, you're trying to find this little piece of paper that has these steps and you're panicking trying to do all of it. Months later, after doing this a number of times, they pull out the throttle, right? You just lost your engine, you're like, oh, okay, you do the seven steps and you're done. And it's super easy. So this is actually the, the part of the engine cutout where it gets really exciting. You set your airspeed for maximum glide, which means you have a you know, lot of gliding. You, you don't, it's not like the cartoons where you go straight down. You actually have a lot of time to figure out what to do. Fuel shutoff valve in, which basically just means maximum fuel from the, from the wings. Mixture rich, fuel selector valve to both. You check the ignition because you probably knocked it out with your, with your knee. And one of those steps usually fixes things and you're, you're in fine shape. So what you learn through that experience is that it's not an emotional reaction. Something happens that causes an emotional feeling, but the way that you handle it is through a set of steps that you've practiced 100 times. So when it actually happens in a real life situation, you've done it before. So when I coach technical analyst traders just learning technical analysis for the first time, we do a very similar thing. We have a technical checklist, and this is exactly what my checklist looks like when I've finished getting them to the point where they have earned the right to be bullish or bearish on a stock. And I taught technical analysis at the MBA level for a couple years at Brandeis University outside of Boston. And uh, we would start with Dow theory, which is just, is it in an uptrend or downtrend? Then we would go through trend lines, moving averages, any key price patterns, where are we at relative to key support and resistance levels, confirmation, I consider anything related to any derivative of the price or volume, so RSI, MACD, some indicator like that. Relative strength, how is the stock doing relative to other stocks like it? After answering those seven questions, you have now earned the right to tell me buy or sell or bullish or bearish. Until then, you are not allowed to do it. And how often, once you start trading, have you ever made a decision where you did not systematically go through all those steps you probably know you should? Of course. So what I would tell you is, number one, write your, and again, this is my list. It doesn't have to be your list. Your list could be very different depending on your time frame and what things you're trading. That's totally fine. But you should have a list. And if you've never written it down, you should do that. <laughs> and write it down and follow it out and actually go through a trade you've made and answer all those questions and see what you might have missed. The other thing I would tell you is emotions are not a bad thing. I think a lot of times behavioral finance, which you know, I've, I've worked with investors trying to understand their behavioral biases, we, it tends to be a very negative thing. We're broken, you're, making, you know, you're wired to make bad decisions, but your emotions actually do have value. A lot of traders talk about a sixth sense um, uh, uh, that, that, that helps fuel, something just doesn't feel right. And that's okay, there actually could be value there, right? If something causes you to revisit a position that just doesn't feel right, maybe there's something there. But you should go through a systematic process to validate those emotions. Don't just make the trade based on an emotion, have a structure to, uh, to what you're deciding. Now that we've recognized we have a problem, we have restrained ourselves by using checklists, now what do we do? Well, we need to respect the markets, right? The markets are out of our control. I've mentioned the illusion of, of control. This is a little outdated, but this is a chart of the S&P 500 going back to the uh, early 1980s. So you have the 87 crash, the you know, 83 high, breaking to new highs, Dow breaking above uh, 1,000 and uh, for good. Uh, we have the secular bear market in the 2000s and then uh, to where we're at now. Um, so <laughs> overall, is the market in an uptrend or downtrend for the last couple decades? All right. It's in an uptrend. So as much as all the noise, all the volatility, all the craziness can impact things day to day, don't forget that this is what the long-term trend is. Long-term, equities do just fine. Don't forget that. But remember, we cannot control it. You cannot force the market to go up, force it to go down. And that sounds so silly, but you do it at some point. You are looking at a position that's going down and you just try to mentally get the red to turn into green as it goes up a little bit. But we have to recognize that there are things out of our control. Again, going back to a 12-step program, there's a reason why you do this sort of, uh, I call it the serenity prayer. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I can't change Courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. There are things that are within your control and it's, it's what happens up here. It happens up to the moment that you hit buy or sell or add or, or subtract a position. What happens after that is out of your control and that's okay. But you need to focus on the things that you actually can improve on, right? 
So it goes back to the name of my firm, which was Sierra Alpha Research. Um, Sierra Alpha is actually slang for situational awareness. And those of you that have flown a plane, you probably know situational awareness is when you're flying an airplane, it's having an awareness of what's going on around you, looking out of the cockpit and seeing what's happening. Because if you don't have a good situational awareness, you do things around Seattle like flying into a mountain or flying into the clouds and getting disoriented, flying into the ground, running out of gas, um, things get pretty hairy. One of my hairier moments, I had a couple. Um, luckily, it was all with an instructor who, who was able to handle things just fine. Uh, but uh, essentially, my first night flight. So you have to have a couple hours flying at night, which is a little tough. I was doing it around Boston, and the, the ground has lights, all, the, all the, the lights and the houses and everything. The sky has lights with all the stars, and so the horizon's actually hard to pick out, so it gets a little disorienting. You have to trust your instruments and everything. But all of a sudden, we're going, and they, they teach you if you see lights around, uh, you know, up in the air, and they're not moving, that means the plane is act either flying away from you or flying directly at you. But if it's at you, it's bad, right? So you need to work on that. So we're doing our night flight, and he's like, all right, so, you know, how are things going? I'm like, feeling pretty good. Yeah, I'm getting it. We're going west to, to Connecticut, no problem. He's like, all right, you see anything on the horizon that you need to be concerned about? And I'm like, now starting to think, uh-oh, you know, maybe. I'm like, um, no. He's like, all right, look around 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Do you see anything? I'm like, okay, yep, no, there's a plane right over there. He's like, all right, you guys are in a collision course, right? If you don't move, he's going to run into you. So he immediately pushed the yoke way down. We go down about 500 feet. The other plane never budged. They just kept going right where we were. Had we not moved, we would have hit in midair, which is actually really hard to do, but we probably would have come pretty close to it. So luckily, again, I had an instructor. I never uh, you know, forgot that lesson as I, as I progressed through the, through the training. But what you learn is you have to have a situational awareness. As investors, how often do we forget to pay attention to what's going on around us? We get the blinders on. We focus on a particular trade, a particular position. We forget to have an awareness of what's going on uh, around us. So the name of my firm, Situational Awareness, is all about having an awareness of what's going on around us. How many of you have golfed before? Many of us. Good. I'll do a quick story. I used to golf with my father uh, once a week when we lived in Cleveland. A little harder now that I'm on the other side of the country, but uh, we would golf once a week, go out together, hit 18 together. It was really, really fun. Uh, a fun summer for sure. Um, he got up to a 170-yard par 3 hole, something like that. My father is now 72. He still outdrives me, which is a very emotionally very difficult for me to deal with because I'm, I'm, I'm taller, I'm bigger, I should be crushing it, but he just, I think he uses his hips better. I don't know what it is, but it's, it's killing me. At some point, he will get old enough that he will not outdrive me, but it's not yet, sadly. Um, so he gets up to this par, you know, par three hole, gets out of like a six iron or seven iron or something embarrassing, and he, he sets up. That's the right club for that distance. Two things that he missed, though. Number one, the green was elevated, so we're kind of hitting uphill a little bit, right? And number two, there was a, a headwind. Winds were coming at us from, you know, from the green to where we're at. So what happened to his perfectly swung seven iron that should have landed right on the green? Landed short, right? Two things he missed, right? The elevated green, the wind coming at us. This is what I find people do with charts incorrectly. They have a really good set of tools but that's not enough. You need to understand the environment and have an awareness of what's going on around you. A lot of times I find people are looking at the wrong chart. They do the analysis just fine, but the problem is not the analysis of the chart. It's you're not looking at the right chart in the first time. We find, a, or in the first place, find that a lot of times with professional investors. You, you come up with a story, come up with a stock, come up with a position, and you forget that there are thousands of other stocks you could buy or sell at any moment, right? So it's all about screening and having a good process for identifying what's going on around you. This is my process. Obviously, I use stockcharts.com very heavily, and this is a um, series of uh, chart lists that I go through every morning. I actually call it the Stock Charts Morning Coffee List. And every morning, I've set up this series of charts, and I start at the top, and I go through every one. It's about 400 charts. It takes me about 30 minutes to do. And I do every, every morning, I do that same thing. What happens because I do it the same way every morning is I tend not to miss things because I've looked at it yesterday, I looked at it the day before, I'm gonna look at it tomorrow, and you can see as the TLT rolls over and bonds start to come out of favor. You can see when semiconductors break out on a relative basis and just continue going. All those things come up because of the continued routine that I do. If that sort of thinking is of interest, there's a YouTube video that we recorded uh, uh, earlier this year called The Morning Coffee Routine. If you look for that with my name, you'll, uh, you'll find me talking for about 30 minutes about how I go through those steps in a little more detail. So now we respect the world around us. The fourth step is to review for opportunities. Review where you are relative to where you could be. Um, another aviation example here. This is uh, a rare moment where I was, uh, and, and to be honest with you, once you get up in the air a couple thousand feet and you're flying straight and level, flying's pretty boring. There's a lot of downtime. 
And a lot of the comparisons that I'm making with you right now came out of discussions with my flight instructor at the time who traded stocks when he wasn't up in the air. And when he learned I was a professional market strategist, we had lots to talk about when we were flying kind of straight and level. This was on my first long solo where I flew from Norwood, Massachusetts, west to, I think it was like Orange County or something, which is, uh, which is actually around uh, Hartford, and then down to Groton, which is right on the, uh, on the river, on the ocean, and then back up to, to Norwood. This is on that last leg of the flight. This is out the right uh, window, and that's Portland, uh, not Portland, Providence, Rhode Island, uh, out the right side, which looks beautiful from up in the air. A little rougher on the ground, but pretty good from the air right there. Um, so I am looking and enjoying the view of uh, Providence and the ocean and see Cape Cod uh, uh, about, about 2 o'clock, which is really nice. But while I was doing that, I was also looking out uh, around me and making sure I knew what, would, what I would need to do in case of emergency. So it might be a little hard to see, but right there is an airport called North Central, just northwest of uh, Providence. So in the case if something happened right at that moment, I, in my mind I'm thinking, yep, I make a left turn, here's how I get down there, I could glide to that, no problem. So you're always looking for where else you could go, what else you need to do, uh, and what opportunities might uh, need to present themselves. It's funny, a lot of times we don't, as I mentioned, we, we're not looking at the right chart. And so besides having a good process for reviewing what the world looks like, you also need to leverage screening tools. And, Years ago, in my, uh, in my early days, and I asked one of, the, one of the people we interviewed today, what would you tell a younger self? And I'll tell you what I would have told my younger self, which is don't do what I'm about to show you. I had this idea where I was like, all right, I'm going to make sure I stay on top of everything. I'm going to have a steady stream of new ideas. So I'm going to set an alert every time certain things happen. All right, when something makes a new 13-week high, I want an alert. When something breaks down through the 50-day moving average, I want an alert. I came up with these things. So what happened after I hit engage on my Bloomberg terminal? It was like a nonstop fire hose of crap coming at me, right? Some of them were interesting, but it was so much noise. This is just like a 10 minute period and things are just bada 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 coming at, and especially right at the open, it was nightmarish. So what happens? My blood pressure starts going, I'm freaking out because I'm like, oh my God, what, doing? what am I doing with all this stuff? So what I have learned over time, I think as I've matured as an investor, is alerts are fine if that's something that is really driving your process. There are times when they're appropriate, but I think for many of us, there's a reason why you should turn them off, just like your email notification should always be off too. You don't need to know when someone sent you an email. Have a scheduled time when you go and actually look at those emails. Same thing, so I have found alerts are bad for me. Screening tools are good. I have a time every day when I look on stockcharts.com for some screens that I like to run, and that's where I look for ideas. And I do it the same way every day, every week, and that's what is a much more disciplined way to do it. So use the technology not to overwhelm you with ideas. Be thoughtful, be uh, you know, uh, intentional about when you're looking for ideas by using screening tools um, to, your, uh, to your benefit. The fifth mode is to reflect. Have a regular process, a regular time, whether it's once a week, once a month, once a year, where you look back and identify where you've really crushed it and where you got crushed. And as an example, I will show you, this is, um, uh, an, an example, uh, a shot of, a, uh, of an elevator, uh, escalator, but uh, in London, uh, when I used to go to our Fidelity office there all the time, there's this one uh, tube stop, and I forget which name it was, I should remember that at some point, but it is literally, I, it's got to be the tallest escalator in the history of mankind. This thing goes up forever, and you're like 10 stories down or something ridiculous, and you get off the tube, you get on the, this escalator, and it's like five minutes later, and you're like, oh my god, I'm still on this escalator, like where is this? So as you're looking down, you see all these people going by you, you don't feel like you're actually making any progress. <laughs> but when you look up and you see where you're getting to and you look back and see where you've come from, that's where the progress really starts to emerge. That's where you really start to respect where you've come from, how far you've come and where you still need to go. As investors, we need to do that. So my, uh, my two, two thoughts I have on this. Number one, if you're using charts, which it sounds like most of you are, use your ch charts not as a painting that you would hang up on your wall. Treat it as a notebook. Treat it as a way to capture your thinking over time and how that's evolved. So on stock charts, I use the annotation tools. You can put text on your charts. It saves them automatically in a chart list. So this is a particular stock. And I said on this date, June 9th, it's overbought. I'm going to watch for a pullback about a month and a half later. I said healthcare sector is living strong on a rotation graph, which is a sector rotation discipline, looking at AbbVie, which is a good name in the space, uh, and, and thinking about a pullback, buying at new highs. I like the chart, so et cetera, et cetera. You can read my comments. What's good about this is anytime I look at Avi, I can, I can see what I was thinking. I've put the data on there so I know if I made a really bad decision, I know what went into that very quickly. So what you need to do is capture your thinking. Then you need to have a process to go back and review what you've done. 
Um, anyone speak Latin or study Latin at some point? Do you know what post-mortem means? After death, we probably all do, right? Um, so quick story on this. I went to Ohio State, a small liberal arts college in Columbus, Ohio. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I had this really good idea as an undergrad. I needed money, as most of us would, and uh, I didn't have a job. And so I was looking at when I'm going to find a job, because I'm taking classes, I'm doing all so I was um, a musician, so I'm doing a lot of gigs. But I realized the, the secret. I could work overnight. So I would go to class, do all those things, go to work at 9 p.m., work till 7, no problem. While all, all these other idiots are sleeping, I'm going to make some money. And then I'll go to Latin at 7.30 a.m., which is what I tried to do for one semester. Ask me how much Latin I remember uh, after that. Uh, zero. Uh, it was, I made great money because they paid secure. And, and I'm, I don't know if you can tell. I mean, I'm tall, but I'm not. I'm, I'm a pretty type B personality. I'm not going to stop anyone from doing anything. I tended to fall asleep, and people would have to wake me up and, and let me badge them into the, uh, to the dorm. It wasn't a great job, but it paid well. Um, and I was very tired. Uh, Post-mortem means after death. And a post-mortem analysis is basically after a project, if you're in technology, pretty common after a project, you look back, how did it go, what went well, what went poorly, how can we improve on what we're doing? Uh, at Fidelity, we used to do what we called the worst call meeting. Everyone would have to come uh, every six months. We would have all the analysts come. What was your worst call? Print it out, put it on the table, and explain to everyone what you did, what caused that decision, what you learned from it. So once we started this regular meeting, two things happened. Number one, magically everyone's performance just got a little bit better. <laughs> and I think it's because no one wanted to come in and admit to some bonehead decision because you couldn't sweep it under the rug. We would know this was your worst call. Here it is. Tell us all about it. And then the second thing was there was this great dialogue as we all started to share what was happening. And sometimes it was just not paying attention to the evidence that was clear. Sometimes the toolkit was incomplete. We missed some input. And so that's how you improved your toolkit over time. So my question, my challenge to all of you, when do you do a good post-mortem analysis on your own trading, on your own investing? Find a time. We are getting near the end of the year. The week between Christmas and New Year's is a really good time to tend to do this. Look back over the last six months, pick your worst call, and put it out there and explain to a friend what you did. You will learn a lot about where you can improve your process just by doing that. With institutional investors, with financial advisors that I spent a lot of time coaching, I also ask them, uh, we review the top and bottom stocks within their universe, within their benchmark. You might have a list of futures, ETFs, stocks, options, whatever that you trade that you tend to do. That's your universe, your investable universe. Uh, this was year 2018, calendar year. These are the five top stocks during that year and the five worst performers in the benchmark. So the question is, number one, did you own the top five stocks? If so, Nice work, but I bet you missed at least one of those. What did you miss, right? What was there, what evidence could you have seen that would have gotten you into those names that you clearly ignored, right? Is your toolkit incomplete or are you ignoring something really meaningful? On the opposite, did you own any of those bottom five names and why the hell did you own them through that experience, right? At some point, you should have stopped and Ned Davis, uh, you know, who, who I got to know during my Fidelity years, uh, used to say all large losses begin as small losses, <laughs> okay? So the game is not hitting home runs. The game is preventing small losses from emerging as larger and larger losses and really destructing your ability to re-deploy re, re, uh, that capital. So it's looking at some of those names. Did you own any of those names and what did you miss? Where should you have stopped out and you didn't? So I would encourage you with your investable universe, put them in order on performance, do it at the end of the year, do it at the end of the month, whenever is appropriate, and actually do that analysis. See what you owned and what you didn't, and just see where the opportunities may have been out there with a better situational awareness, maybe you would have uncovered it. We are almost out of time, so I did want to share after these five modes just a general market outlook. I love to ask people what your one chart is, and what I mean is when I bring people on my, my show, The Final Bar, I, I ask them, if you had one chart and only one chart that could tell you how the overall market was doing, how to do it, what would it be and why? So this is my gift to you is this is my one chart and it's intentionally a very long-term chart. And not knowing all of you and what timeframes you operate on, I bet you do not pay enough attention to the longer term timeframe. All the movements today, this week, this month are all within a much larger trend. Um, I interviewed Brian Shannon earlier. He wrote a fantastic book about 10 some years ago, technical analysis on multiple timeframes, really well written, talks about using weekly, daily, monthly, intraday all together, thinking about the higher level and shorter level uh, timeframes. So I would encourage you to pay attention to the longer term timeframe if you don't do enough. This is a weekly chart going back about five years, uh, pretty up to date. 
And essentially, it is a weekly bar chart. It's the 21 and 34 week exponential moving averages. Those are longer than many of you probably would ever think to look at. Look at them. Because overall, that will keep you on the right side of the cyclical trends. That will tell you the trend in the market. And until we start breaking down through those moving averages, regardless of what you think might be happening, the trend is still up by definition. It is not down until you break down through some of those longer term moving averages. Then this is using what's called the PPO. It's similar to the MACD indicator. It's based on percent moves. And what's happened in the last week is the PPO or the weekly MACD has given a buy signal. So this is sort of the secular long-term trend, the weekly MACD or the PPO, I think of it as sort of the cyclical, more tactical trend. These are all firing positive. So regardless of what you might think of all the potential headwinds, all the macro stories that might prevent stocks from going up, they're going up. And this chart confirms by definition that that's happening. I'll grab a question in just a minute, okay? To wrap up, if you're interested in anything that I talked about, want to think more about decision making and, and my approach to the markets, you sort of see I have a very simplistic toolkit because my career has been spent with people that are not technically oriented. They're fundamental investors. I want them to understand how the charts fit into a holistic process. I host a show every day, 4 p.m. Eastern on Stock Charts TV uh, called The Final Bar. I have a lot of guest interviews. So you can get to it from stockcharts.com if you've not seen it already. Uh, and then I actually have a YouTube channel called Market Misbehavior. Um, one of the things I did recently was talk about the first thing in the morning. What's the very first thing you look at financially related? And watch this video and think about what you look at first because you're priming your brain for the entire rest of the day. So make sure it's the right thing. So check that out on YouTube if you haven't. And then just to conclude, if you can look at the tickers on these uh, six charts, you get my final message, which is thank you. Thanks so much. <clears throat>